A few weeks ago, I reviewed a new risk calculator called the Prevent Calculator, which purports to be more accurate than all the other risk calculators. And since most risk calculators overestimate risk in a population, the values would be lower. Today, let's look at how some doctors have reacted to this. Stay tuned. So the cardiovascular risk calculators, they're notorious for overestimating cardiovascular risks in populations. And risk estimates are meaningless when it comes to individuals because they give you a number between 0% and 100%, but in reality, either you're going to have a heart attack, 100%, or you're not, 0%. So getting a number like 7% really doesn't help us a whole lot, but it's all we've got to go with and that's the state of things as they are now. The new Prevent Calculator, which I reviewed earlier, it purports to give more accurate values. And I asked then, will new guidelines simply increase the threshold to keep the same number of people on statins, or are they gonna say, oh, this is much more accurate, our thresholds are based on philosophical considerations or whatever it is, but we'll just go with the new values. So we don't know yet, but some feedback has started to come in, and we're gonna look at differing attitudes about that. From an article entitled, Statins for Primary Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease with Prevent, reference to the calculator, what's a clinician to do? Let's look at the introduction to the article. Quantitative decision tools are ubiquitous in medicine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what I've highlighted here in the first paragraph is, although the overarching concept that an individual's absolute risk should guide the initiation and intensity of preventive measures has not changed, risk prediction tools have evolved over time. So what they're saying is, yeah, our, our approach was good, but now we have more accurate data to work with. Then they go on to say each iteration of risk prediction tools from the Framingham equations, which are the older ones, up to the pooled cohort equations, and most recently the prevent equations, has resulted in improved accuracy and precision by revising the predictors, outcomes, and populations. Then they go on to say, additionally, as the evidence base for the benefits and risk of preventive treatments has evolved over time, lower risk patients are recommended for initiation of drug therapy for primary prevention. The recent development of PREVENT has raised some potential uncertainty around appropriate decision thresholds for preventive intervention, such as statin initiation and continuation. Well, that's interesting that there's uncertainty about these thresholds. I, I see this as almost a tacit admission that the thresholds are developed to achieve a certain level of treatment, a certain amount of the population is going Going to be treated rather than as any kind of objective selection. I mean, we know that the risk thresholds like seven and a half percent, it's a value judgment. Here it seems that they're admitting that the better risk values mean the treatment thresholds have become uncertain. Well, why would they become uncertain? You're just getting better data. If the thresholds were good, the thresholds were good. Apparently, that's not the thought process behind it. Finally, they say the uncertainty provides the opportunity to review why decision thresholds are useful the evidence that informs current guideline thresholds and how clinicians may respond to the availability of new risk estimation model while awaiting updated guidelines. Well, if this is just more accurate information and the guidelines before were legitimate, then there's no problem here. Okay, we've got better values. Let's apply the guidelines. I mean, that should be their thinking. I think that guidelines are kind of garbage, but that should be their thinking. The fact that now we're getting better values and that says the values are more accurate and they're lower, I guess we can't can't use these thresholds anymore. That to me is an admission of the games that they're playing. So to this article, there were three doctors who responded with their commentary on it. This first one is a practicing physician, so he's not just a clinical trial researcher pushing numbers. A minor point here, he starts out by saying the prevent guidelines to determine statin eligibility. So there's an admission, it is about statin eligibility, nothing else. We'll simply cut down the number of patients eligible for statins. And he seems to imply that's a bad thing and we'll go on. The chief risk factors for the disease is cigarette smoking, dyslipidemia, and hypertension. I would argue that he, he left out type two diabetes, may have just been an oversight. I'm sure the doctor is aware of that, but I would put dyslipidemia, bad lipid quality, fourth in line. If you just look at what the calculators give us, Smoking, type two diabetes, and hypertension are all higher risk factors than low quality cholesterol. And if you have high quality cholesterol, probably not a risk factor at all. However, the risk calculators only look at quantity rather than quality. 
He goes on to say that the Framingham Heart Study has maintained for the last 45 years that the best lipid measure is simply the ratio of CT, doesn't define it, but cholesterol total, I guess, to HDLC, and, and that's common. So he's basically saying 45 years, we've made no advances. This is the best thing that we can do. He goes on to criticize the prevent risk calculator for using some few other factors that are secondary in nature. And while these may all be legitimate points, it does use some other secondary factors. He uses a zip code, for example. The problem is he's not arguing against the accuracy of it. He's simply commenting on the inputs to it. And, and his comments are, are valid, certainly, but where's the discussion about accuracy? His conclusion, thus prevent will not better prevent the disease, but will rather allow more disease events to occur since fewer people will be offered therapy. Going back to Framingham would solve this problem and likely reduce the prevalence of the clinical ATD. So what he's really saying here is, I don't like the consequences of using a more accurate prediction, so we shouldn't use it. That's no other way to interpret this. Fewer people will be offered statins using this risk calculator, Therefore, this must be bad. So this is a pro-statin position. Let's look at another reaction. This is from JJ, who is also a practicing physician. Now this doctor has clearly been able to read the article. I couldn't read it, it's behind a paywall because medical knowledge is a for-profit thing here with these journals. And I understand they are businesses and they do have to make money, but you would think that certain things would be of such public benefit, of such public interest that we ought to be able to read it. In my practice, more patients perceive side effects from statins than this article suggests. So apparently this article did talk about adverse effects and this doctor is pointing out that they're higher than the article suggests. So this is really good because now I see that we've got a doctor who is listening to his patients. He goes on to say, I don't feel that the number needed to treat for statins justifies the heavy-handed approach that health plans put forth for quality measures that are tied to physician rating reimbursement. And I've covered that before about how the Medicare system will reward doctors for pushing statins. Doesn't even look at whether there's a reduction in cholesterol. Just says you get extra payments for pushing the statins. So this is great. The doctors called out the NNT and this heavy-handed approach. So I think it's especially important that he's acknowledging here this heavy-handed approach, as he calls it, it creates an adversarial relationship with the patient. I certainly had an adversarial relationship with my ex-doctor over this very issue. She was not listening to my complaints about adverse effects I was experiencing. Her favorite phrase, which I've said before, was statins don't cause that. The best way to lose patients is to take an attitude with them like that. He goes on to say, I'd like to see further analysis that includes patient preferences and a larger picture of aging and how statin use will affect the misery score at the end of life. And that's in quotes, so I think this is a, a concept, a theoretical concept. I don't think there is an actual misery score, but you get his point. He's saying that we should not just consider the cold, hard numbers, which are suspect to begin with, but patient preferences and how much it's going to make them miserable. I mean, I witnessed elderly relatives who have a high misery score, as it would be called here. One of them, for example, knows the statins are hurting him, are making him miserable, but he won't get off them because his doctor has him convinced that he'll have a heart attack the next day if he starts taking them. And at one point, I was headed that way towards at least having a high misery index later in life when I was taking the statins. Third reaction, is from a retired doctor. He points out the models are imprecise. He talks about the exceptions. He talks about a patient who you would think is at high risk, turns out to have no problems, and a patient who you would expect to have no problems to have considerable cardiovascular disease, such as plaque buildup. He points out that better tests exist and they've come down in price. Now, when I was put on statins, I asked my doctor, I said, you're doing this all based on cholesterol, why? And he said, well, because it's gonna cause plaque buildup. I said, well, why don't we measure and see whether I have any plaque buildup now? Oh no, those tests, are, they're not cost effective. We, we just do it this way. Well, this doctor is saying that's nonsense. Let's actually maybe use the quality of the cholesterol, bad trigs to HDL ratio, for example, oxidized LDL, LP little a, pattern A versus pattern B LDL, and use those as a red flag to say, hey, we should look further. This is a good indication that we ought to just go in and measure and see if there is real cardiovascular disease because that's what most people don't realize. Cholesterol levels, they're just an indicator. They're just a proxy for saying that somebody has cardiovascular disease. It is not a measure of cardiovascular disease. You have to actually get in and do maybe a carotid intima media thickness test. 
a CIMT, or a coronary artery calcium score, CAC, or the cardiac CT that this doctor is talking about. Ultimately, money would be saved on prescriptions not written. He's acknowledging that we should be reducing statins and prescribing them only to the people who are really gonna benefit. That's something I've been pushing since the earliest videos on this channel, that the shotgun approach, just give statins to everybody and we'll, we'll get everybody who needs to be on them. We'll get a bunch of people who don't need to be on them. He's saying here, let's do a better job of identifying who could actually benefit, so I'm all for that. So for my closing thoughts, it's, it's clear to me that the reactions to the potential more accurate, which means lower risk calculations from this prevent calculator, reflects more on the attitudes of the commenters than it does on the calculator itself. The calculator is secondary. What we see here is the attitudes put forth. So this wasn't a scientific survey. There are only three comments offered, but I'd summarize them like this. Reaction number one, more accurate information will lead to fewer statin prescriptions, so we shouldn't use it. When the truth leads to something you don't like, let's not do it. Number two, we need to consider patient values and potential harms when considering treatments. Can't argue with that. And number three basically said we should use this more accurate information as a basis for deciding to perform direct measurements rather than relying solely on these indicators to decide on treatment. So two out of three ain't bad. Maybe the tide is finally turning. Maybe I'm too Pollyannish. Time will tell. So if you appreciate this content, please like, share, subscribe, and comment on this topic or others you'd like me to cover. And if you haven't seen this video, I recommend you take a look at it now. Thanks for listening.